It's a uh, teaching, and uh, I wanted to touch his spirit. I, I just alluded to some things last week, and I uh, want to touch it in a, mi- a little bit more full of detail, so I'm going to um, just teach some things. But some very thing, interesting things happened through the week. I've had a lot of phone calls from overseas and different places, and uh, somebody mentioned two things to me, or two people, and uh, when I got on the net, I found that this had actually gone viral around the world. And one is a conversation or an interview with the devil. Now, it is rather bizarre but very, very interesting. And I'm going to read a little of it to you because it is so well done. Whoever put this together, they would have to have a subtle perception to the degree of understanding the mind of the devil in order to do it. And then I want to just mention, secondly, another message that's gone viral around the world. And then I want to just do some teaching on the tabernacle. Because what I want you to understand is we are living in a day of emotion and feelings. And I am appalled. I am absolutely appalled at what I'm seeing and hearing across the earth. Now, throw your stones, do what you like. I don't particularly care. The issue is people are led by emotion. I feel this, I feel that. It is junk, absolute rubbish. We are not to be motivated by feeling. The scripture says we are to worship God in spirit and in and by the truth. Let me just read this to you as I begin. It's an interview with the devil. He says, how do you want me to address you? He said, oh, chief is good. Okay, chief. What do you have to say to those who believe in you? I said, nothing. No hard feelings. I prefer anonymity anyway. I've learned to postpone gratification, as it were. I'm a behind-the-scenes type anyway. The primal conspiracy and everything associated with what I do is better coming from a silent partner. So... I don't care if they believe in me or if they don't. But surely, the interviewer says, you've seen some of the things that are happening in the world and I have to ask, are you behind this? Especially in the, in the Middle Eastern arena. Yes, surely I am. Everything I put my hand to, I am behind. Everything that is related to destruction, I am behind. So, he asks the question, then how do you go about this in keeping your anonymity? He said, well, I've been around since the beginning. I've learned a lot. (laughs) I let a few classics slip through, and one of the most effective means that I have found is by using film and Hollywood. So he said, nobody will arouse suspicion because it's called entertainment and people have learned to live by feelings. Then he says, the question is, such as? In other words, give me an example. The devil, well, take a simple movie like Ben-Hur, The Ten Commandments. Moses was born and I used it by interweaving human emotion and Human love into it. That's what he says. So he said, all of these, Wuthering Heights, Citizen Kane, all that I have teased people with drama is to bring people into a state of illusion. And he said, so then I began to introduce evil and human suffering, which of course is my particular delight. Well, you have a situation where the viewer must suspend their disbelief or pretend, as it were, 
And I saw that if I could manipulate the content, I could have masses of entertained viewers going to hell in a proverbial bucket of popcorn with extra butter, if I might say so. Well, what type of movies seem to work the best for you? Horror? Pornography? Action? The devil. Romance, actually. Romance. I must admit, they all serve a great purpose, the things you've mentioned above, towards my goal. Pornography is one of the greatest inventions, but for now, romance holds and takes the crown. The devil answers this question when he's asked, how can you say that? It's no question at all, no, 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 no illusion at all concerning me. You see, if I was able, through the movies, to begin to come and confront with the highest form of evil, people would leave and walk away. So what I have trained them to do is to draw upon their emotions and get involved. And they have no idea what has happened. So, when they are sitting there in entertainment, I have an open door. No one in their right mind wants to confront pure evil. They're much too wise for that. But I personally supervise the making of every romance or quick chick flick, as they are sometimes called. Why do you agree then to this interview? Because it may divulge your anonymity, and expose you, blow your cover up. The devil, nah. Nobody believes in old Satan anymore. I'm an antiquated idea, you know. Unproved as well. When you claim that God was dead, you figured I was as well. Since I am unproven by modern science, a figment of your imagination... I'm set for life. Think of it like this. You've been to church. Because that's how I want church to be. So that people are caught into the drama of what is happening, but leave and feel no association or relationship. No commitment to anyone. I get them there, you dress a little better, try to think pure thoughts, get into a religious frame of mind, say hello to everyone, smile right. But the sense of commitment and family and love, a guy pay for one another, it is a thing of the past. And you sense a pervasive dichotomy during the week when you leave because you have no personal association or relationships anymore. Because you've built your foundations of relationship on the wrong type of love, emotion. That is what I do with romance movies. That's what I've done all the way along. The ideal relationships on the screen are two-dimensional. They're always and only experienced from a distance. They can't have it, but they can lust after it. People get discouraged. They see comfort in relationship, but I've made it so divorced from them, it's an association they can look for but never attain. I've turned the natural human desire to belief down a cul-de-sac. It's the same with church. And if I can make people associate God with this dichotomous feeling because I have involved their emotions, they eventually say, what's the use? And walk away. And it's happening And I am at the end of my program. I am about to take the world. But there are some exceptions, don't you believe? The questioner asks. Some people are happily married. The devil, yes. And some win the lottery. There is no solution. Society is so depersonalized and isolating and insulated that no relationship can make up for the lack of community. It will get harder and harder and harder as I twist the thumbscrews more and more. You watch me. Less and less of this thing called fellowship 
will be attainable. And that is what it is all about because people will no longer commit to one another because love is no longer commitment. It's a lust. It's a desire. The more lonely and miserable people are, the more they want that essential connection. But the more they want it, the less they can have it. Romance has been the greatest weapon in my arsenal. You're lucky to be living at such a time when all my work is finally completed and finally being concluded. And you're able to watch and see the master stroke of my hand as I begin to subvert the whole entire world because I have destroyed the church. He says, nobody will commit to anyone anymore. As a friend of mine once said, those best suited for love desire at least. The more lonely and miserable people are, the more they want that essential connection, but they will never find it because they're looking in the wrong place and they are looking and searching for the wrong type of love. The less they will experience, romance is my greatest weapon without question. So you are very lucky to be living at a time like this. I've got people falling in and out of love so fast they don't even have time to think. And the beautiful thing is that many make it their real goal in life, thinking this is what it is all about. And this is how I will finally bury the church. I will take them and host an annual singles ball in hell for them all, especially the church. The second one, And it's gone viral. It is rather unusual, and I don't know what to make of it. But it's very interesting, and it's very prophetic. On the 28th of December, 2012, a young man, 44 years of age, was caught up to heaven. And the Lord took him through heaven. It's an actual testimony. It's long. It's incredibly long, so I don't want to read it to you. I don't want to go into it. But this young guy has lived his life as an atheist, totally agnostic, totally opposed to God. And he gets caught up as he attempted to take his life for a third or fourth time. And he gets taken into heaven, and he tells a story. And it's literally just going viral all over the internet at the moment. And he gets taken and suddenly the Lord meets him in heaven and takes him through heaven and he describes describes some of the most amazing things. And I'm telling you, you could not use the terminology and the expression and the terms that this man uses unless you had seen it for yourself. He says, I am just awestruck. He said, at what I saw. He said, I saw mountains and waterfalls. And he said, literally 300 miles high. He said, heaven is the most majestic place I have ever experienced. And he said, and as the Lord took me and said, come with me. He said, he took me. I met angels. I met people. Met people I knew. And as we journeyed through heaven, he said, I was just absolutely awestruck. And I could not find words to describe what I saw. Colors and sound music and taken to the throne of God. And he said, when he went into the throne of heaven, he said, suddenly something opened in his spirit. And he said, the Lord looked at me and began to smile. He said, do you remember something? And the man says, I've been here before. And the Lord said, yes, you have. He said, when you were born premature, four months prem, you died in your mother's womb. He said, I took you and I sat you on my knee and I told you, young man, you have to go back. You went back because I told you you had a destiny in life. But you will never know anything about it until you turn comes to the age of the the end of your 44th year, 
28th of December, his birthday, 2012. He said, now you're here. I've been waiting for this moment because your destiny now begins. He said, you have attempted to commit suicide because life has been pointless and you have had no understanding of what has been going on because you were an agnostic, an unbeliever. Now I'm sending you back because you cannot remain here. I told him you've attempted to commit suicide on four occasions. And he said, literally, you have had no association with any education concerning God. And God said, and the Lord said to him, I planned it this way so that you will speak as one that has never known me. But now you remember what I said to you when you were a little child, died in the womb, and then came back two more times as you were being born in your prim years, premature years, because you didn't want to go back to earth because of what you experienced. But I had to send you back three times, so ultimately you were born. And then three more times you tried to commit suicide. But as I told you, the Lord says, I told you, you have a destiny to fulfill on earth. And on the 28th of December, he said, suddenly it all came back, and he remembered everything that had happened through his entire life. And the Lord begins to speak to him. He said, you have eight years left before the world ends. And he begins to describe what's going to take place. (coughs) And he says, your eight years that you have are going to be absolute years of incredible and impeccable onslaught against the church. People will be divided. People will be split. You are going to experience the greatest persecution you have ever experienced in your entire life. But he said, there's a line drawn in the sand, and he said, people will step one side or the other. Those who choose to step on the side of the Lord, I will protect and I'll provide supernaturally. You're going to see it. And he goes through this whole portrayal of what is about to happen. It's incredible. Absolutely incredible. So what I'm saying, he also begins to go into the fact how the Lord speaks to him and says that I grieve because my people no longer understand commitment. They have no appreciation. And the reason why many will go down is because they have no idea of loyalty and commitment. Nate, could you bring that over? I was up about 2.30 this morning sitting at the computer and my, tell you what, man, I've had just attacks like you wouldn't believe. And I'm sitting there just putting some things together and just looking at a lot of this. And my brand new computer, just blue screened, gone down, crashed. And I lost it all. However, what I want to share with you is just what I felt the Lord give to me. And I want you to understand this scripture. The Bible tells us in the Gospel of John, chapter 4, verse 23, where the Lord is talking to the woman at the well. He said, the Father seeks such that will worship him are those who worship in spirit and in truth. So I want to tell you concerning the tabernacle of Moses. Because do you understand that in the tabernacle of Moses there were three priests? Three types of priests. One was allowed into this area, outer court. One was allowed into the inner court. And only one was allowed into the most holy. Three totally different priests. Jesus said this. He said, I am the way. I am the truth. And I am the life. Christians all over the world know the way, but they've never submitted to the truth. And there's Christians all over the world that know the way 
and even know the truth, but have never experienced the life. And the only way you'll ever do that is on your knees before God. And I'm telling you, if there's ever been a time in history and a time in the world, and it's destiny now, it is right now. I'm saying to you, and you've been hearing me say this for months and months and months, you need to begin to get into God like you have never done so before. We are living on the precipice of destruction. And I'm not making any bones about it, and I'm not making any excuses for it anymore. When God began to speak to me last night, I'm telling you, I felt such a sense of urgency in my spirit now to begin a whole new emphasis. And the last thing I want to do right now is do this. However, I have a mandate. In the Scriptures... It tells us that we are not to live out here in the outer court. We're not just to come in here to the inner court, but we're to come here. In the book of Exodus, let me read it to you. In Exodus chapter 25, verse 22, God tells Moses to construct an ark of a covenant. And he said you were to put two cherubim on the lid of that ark and you were to put that ark in the most holy place. And then he said, that's where I will meet with you there. That ark is over here. In the sanctuary, in the most holy place. So that's where I'll meet with you. He said, I will not come out unto you You must come in unto me, for I will not come out to you. So we have to find God, because God in his holiness will remain here, and if we choose not to go there, you'll have a knowledge of God, but you won't experience what God is doing. Because this is where we are now called to live. Not just know the way, not just have a knowledge of the truth, but live the life. I'm going to give you a medical science session in a moment because the Lord began to open this up to me and I'm telling you, it's incredible. I checked it all out last night when my computer went down. I was looking at all the medical terms and I was going through the whole of the brain and the sciences of the brain. And the drugs they're using right now. And I'm, wow, this is unreal. But let me move on. You have a body, you have a soul, and you have a spirit. Those that God will relate to and communicate to are those who will worship him in spirit. Now, if you read the whole of the book of Romans, this is what it says. The greatest conflict is between the soul and the spirit. And in other places it says the flesh, but often the word flesh is literally the word suke, which is soul. Now, your physical body is just the vehicle you use to get around, but that's not who you are. Your vehicle will go to the ground and go to the grave and rot. But your soul and your spirit will go to the presence of the Lord forever. Your body is just the husk. And isn't it interesting that this whole portrayal of the tabernacle of Moses was a place symbolizing you. Because you have an outer body, an outer court. Very interesting that that outer court just had a six foot high fence around the side and it is absolutely open to the light of the natural day and the sun. There's no cover. So you can know the way, you can walk in the way as you think, but you're still walking in natural sight and natural light. The light of this world, not Jesus. Sun, S-U-N. But if you're going to come in and begin to start to walk in truth, 
you come in from this outer court, you come to the inner court, and that has six coverings. Massive big sewn skins together. Badger skins is one of them. But there's six of them. So that no natural light shines in that room whatsoever. And every time they had to erect it, those literal coverings went right to the ground and covered every section of that place. So no natural light would shine into that room. The only thing that gave light in that room is not the natural sun, S-U-N, but the sun, S-O-N, because it is symbolized by the candlestick. The seven-branched candlestick sits at the left of that room as the high priest would walk in. And here it is. It had to be trimmed every morning, every night, refilled with oil by the high priest every day so that it burnt constantly and it gave light to the room. Now, I want you to understand something. That whole room inside there were timber boards literally covered with gold over the shittim wood that the timber was that they used to build it. And that candlestick and its seven-branched flame literally would flicker throughout that whole room, and everything in that room was gold. It would glisten, glitter. Very interesting. That it's all made of gold. And the soul, the second part of man which is now not outside, but inside, is caught with these lusts for gold, for wealth, significance and importance. And you will understand there is an altar of incense in here and there is a table of showbread as well as the candlestick. And each one of these things talks about an area of our life. Candlestick is Jesus Christ. He said, I am the light of this world. You go into the book of Revelation chapter 1 and it says he stands in the middle stem, it means, of the seven branch candlestick. He is it. It's who he is. And the light of the seven churches. I am he that stands in the midst of the seven lampstands. That's him. It's Jesus. It's amazing. When you begin to look at that candlestick, you will find... He was instructed to build it a certain particular way. They call them knots, bowls, flowers. And the man, Bezalel, who made that lampstand was told on every horizontal bar he was to place three knots, three bowls, three flowers. And if you understand what that is, if you see a fruit forming, you will see the flower grows first, then slowly the begin, the fruit begins to appear behind the flower, the flower begins to detract, and then the bowl of the fruit from which it forms this nourishment and attached to the stem of the, of, the, of the branch that holds it. That's what it is. And there were three of them with three parts on each branch. Three knots, three bowls, three flowers. That's nine individual pieces. If you multiply those together because there's three branches on each side, you get three nines is 27. That's the number of books in the New Testament. But if you go down this side, you get another 27. But on the actual vertical stem, which is Jesus, suddenly the way they would have built it was not to use three knots, bowls, and flowers, but it changed to four. So you take 30, 27 down one side and you add another 12 because there's four threes is 12, you get 39. That's the number of books in the Old Testament. It is the most amazing thing, and I don't have the time to go into it, I could teach you for a couple of hours at least on the subject, just on that seven-branched candlestick. I am the light of the world. He that follows me shall not walk in darkness. 
But it's following and walking in His light, not your own. So when you come into this place here, you walk in the light of God's Word. This table of showbread is called the table of life. And they would partake of the table of life in communion with God. And as a result of it, the priests that would go in there literally are saying that, Lord, my fellowship is with you and my allegiance is to you. And what you feed me, I will eat. Most of us won't do that today. Then you came, the high priest, or any priest would come, And he would literally go next to the altar of incense. And you will read that in Revelation chapter 5, verse 8, and Revelation 8, verse 5. And it talks about the altar of incense, where the prayers of the saints are poured upon the coals that burn upon the altar of incense, just before the veil. And as they would literally pour the incense on that altar, the whole room would be filled with the aroma, which is a sweet-smelling savor in the nostrils of God. And then the angel that is doing it says to him, this incense is the prayers and the worship of the saints as they come in there and worship. But I want you to understand something. People say to me, worship is singing, And servitude, yes it is, we are servants. But when you go beyond the veil, and you enter into the Ark of the Covenant, you sit there, servanthood is no longer an issue. It's a relationship. Worship brings you to that veil. Once you part that and go in, there's a mercy seat. God said, that's where I'll meet with you. Take your seat there and I'll commune with you. And then God began to speak to him as a man speaks with his friend. Worship brings you there. Gratefulness, gratitude, thankfulness. But when you enter that place... That's when God speaks back. How many of us actually go in and hear the voice of God? And I'm not talking about, I think, yeah, yeah, this is impressed upon me. I'm talking about hearing the voice of God. How many of you? I guarantee, if I ask for a show of hands, there'd be one or two. When you come in here... God said, that's where I'll meet with you. I won't come out to you. You're going to have to come in with me. When you come in there, that's where I'll speak with you, Moses. And you'll see it again in uh, Exodus 26. Give me a scripture reference there. In, in 26, uh, I thought I'd underlined it. However, never mind. You'll find it there again. It says, that's where I'll meet with you. I will not come out. You will come into me. And that's where I'll speak to you. And as a result, we are called to go into that place. That's where you will experience the life of God there. Leonard Ravenhill and Evan Roberts, who founded the Welsh Revival, made a statement given to them by revelation of God and said that when the Lord returns, they said 4% of the church would make it. You hear that? Both of them independently. Now others are saying it now too. 4% of the Christian church will make it into heaven. 4%. Because if you read the book of Revelation, it talks about 
the Ark of the Covenant and the souls of them that cry out from underneath the altar, those that are in that place. And I'm saying to you, we are entering a time and a phase now where we need to begin to understand some very serious issues. Now, I want to tell you, here, I've written these words, outer court, which is open to the world's light, symbolizes the human outer frame, our body. The inner court represents the soul of man and the sanctuary where the Lord dwells is symbolized by representing the inner spirit, sanctum of God. And that's where we need to begin to concentrate on. So, there are three types of love, do you understand? There is this one, the lowest form of it, and it's called eros. And the word erotica. There is this one, which is called brotherly love, phileo. means a friendship, an affinity, loyalty with someone. But that is not the love of God. Never is that word used of God's love. Never. There is another one. And it's this word that is always used of God's love. Agape. That's spiritual love. And as Daphne said before, It's a love of commitment, and it has nothing to do with emotion. Nothing. 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 Do you hear that? Nothing to do with emotion. It is junk. We get led around by the nose, and we say it's God. Rubbish. Phileo. That's where that love comes from. Because I'm going to teach you something right now in medical science. And you hear what I'm about to say. And if you don't, I'm telling you, it literally could be the making and breaking of you, literally, of your soul. And where you will spend eternity, and I'm deadly serious with what the Lord began to show me last night. I couldn't believe what I'm seeing. Let me read this to you. Now, I'll use medical terms of what's happening today. You will understand there are drugs that are on the market. One of them is called melatonin. Melatonin helps you to begin to settle your spirit so that you can sleep at night and gives you the ability to begin to feel good. It's what they call a feel-good drug. Do you know what happens when you actually watch pornography? and get led around by this emotional love, do you understand that the pituitary gland pumps endocrines and endorphins into your blood system that literally make you feel good, and then comes a desire for more, and that becomes addictive. And it all has to do with this area of the soul. It has nothing to do with the spirit, because the love is totally different. It is a self-pleasing love. Love of the soul. I feel great. I feel to do this. I feel God said. Got nothing to do with that. It's junk. Absolute junk. Because you see, you have in your brain, so the Lord began to show me, you have in your brain a whole area of the cortex of the brain that literally is called a dopamine receptive or receptor. There is a portion of your brain that responds to reward and punishment. And that's how we learn what's right and wrong. But wow, I couldn't believe what I'm seeing. And if you are encouraged, the dopamine receptors produce melatonin. And this drug is released into your bloodstream that makes you feel good. So you go out and do it more. So it has both a negative and a positive. Because in the part of the brain that responds to these 
endocrines. There is the receptors that respond to the good and the ones that respond to the bad. So you know and you learn what's right and what's wrong. So you do what's right and not what's wrong. But do you understand that when you sit in front of your television and you sit in front of your computers, proven, get on your, che- on your, uh, your computer and check it out. So the Lord began to show me this. As I said, on about 2.30 this morning, my computer crashed. and I couldn't go any further with it. But I am telling you, I was just totally astounded at what I am seeing. And as I went in, I looked at all the medical sites and the whole lot of it. They say it's the feel-good drug and part of the human brain. So when you see, guys, a woman outside, immediately, dopamine is released into your bloodstream. Feel good. So what do you do? Look more. It builds a craving in you that is insatiable, that you can never be satisfied and content, you will go and look for more. So you will be drawn and sucked into it. And this is the area that it relates to. It's all about feeling because it's the emotion of the motor part of your brain that affects your physical body. And that's why people start then going into an area, masturbation and all the rest of it. Now I'm being very straight here. And I'm not trying to be super spiritual and I'm not trying to be critical. I'm just telling you the facts. And the more you do it, the more you'll crave for it. Because it has nothing to do with the spirit. It has to do with the emotional part of the brain, which affects your motor system. And you will go out and crave for it and seek to find, to to replicate that feeling again. It's the addictive part of of your brain. It is exactly the same drug that literally is influenced by cocaine, alcohol, and all the forms of addiction, and it locks you into this feeling good whole arena where you get led around to do what you feel is right or feel is good. It has nothing to do with the spirit, because the love of the spirit has got nothing to do with doing what you feel. As I said last week, look at the life of this man, Ahab, and the young man that had a vineyard outside his fence. And he lost everything, lost his life, lost his whole entire inheritance, and got killed for just doing what was right. You think that's fear? Absolutely not. But who said anything about this fallen world being fear? And if you literally live according to seeking after things that you think are going to bring pleasure, then you're literally living in this area here because that's where this domain of the part of the brain of what they call pleasure and pain is. And it literally manipulates and controls the whole physical body that you have and everything you do in life. Let me just give you some facts. Here's they are, as I've written them down. Melatonin produced in the pineal gland, an endocrine hormone that is pumped into the blood to always crave and seek after, be driven, totally, totally unsettled, dissatisfied, craving after something that you can't get, like that very letter interview with Satan I told you about. It's pumped into the blood and it drives people. They can never be satisfied. They can never be fulfilled. They're always craving and yearning for something better. They can't find it. They search after it because you're looking for the wrong thing. Because it's that part, pain and punishment and pleasure. And so consequently... When you form a habit, here's the amazing thing. When you form a habit, neurons in the brain now are filled and become part of the productive area 
those neurons begin to convert over and no longer are influenced by, they become the producers of this drug, dopamine. They get hooked in and your desire begins to increase and your lust and craving for these things and your dissatisfaction increases until your whole mind is in confusion. So, wow, this is unbelievable. And then it goes in. You get on, you get on Wikipedia, check it out. Because that was one of the actual sources that I used, all the medical. You'll see pages and pages and pages of stuff. It took me hours trying to study it through. And I was just intrigued. Absolutely intrigued. It says, in the, their words, not mine, cocaine, methamphetamine, any stimulation literally produces this drug, dopamine. That is a driving force that is released into your blood by way of a hormone and it controls and motivates the cravings of your physical body. And you can never be satisfied. You will look after greater and greater highs. You can never settle. Your whole spirit is literally dissatisfied. You can't sit. You've got to get up and walk and you can't. Just incredible. Here are some of the actual things that it says by way of perversion or human reactions or responses. When this is stimulated and released into your blood, it creates extraversion. You've got to have a position where you're recognized. It drives people to be noticed because it gives them a high. Man, I am somebody. They said some of the greatest fighters and some of the greatest actors, when they have looked at them, their whole brain and part of their whole source of the neurons in their brain, literally there's these receptors have grown so that the whole brain is affected by it. And they are literally just totally can't settle with one wife. They've got to look for somebody else. They can't settle for one job, never ever satisfied, looking for greater and bigger and better things, selling houses and buying better ones. Just absolute craving because they cannot be satisfied. Extroversion is one of them. Insecurity is the negative side of it. People, because of this dopamine and because of their personality, feel insecure. They crave recognition and they go after everything they can. They change jobs. They do this. They do that. They do whatever they've got to do in order to get recognition. All driven by this dependency drug. Alcohol, drugs, cocaine, all forms of addiction are controlled by this part of the brain. Sex addiction as well. And that's why it says when people get involved and give themselves over to that area, the lust area, that works out in the physical, so there's really no cure for it. All you can do is inhibit them, shut them away, or make sure they're never in an environment where they can literally outwork this craving because they can't control it. It has literally possessed their whole brain. Man, I was shocked with what I saw. As I said, I didn't know this. Dopamine receptives are neurons in the brain, which when you're born are a very small area. But the more you self, give yourself over to these desires and fulfilling the lust of the flesh and going after your self-desire and not submitting it to the spirit and allowing it to rule and control your life, the more it will increase in your life until you will no longer be able to control it. It's not a thing that ever remains static unless you impose, they said, self Control And self-control is the self-induced power to limit or inhibit the effect of this, where you make a decision opposed to what your feelings are telling you. You get it. You check it out. I'm not saying anything here that's of my own opinion. I was shocked when I began to see this. It's what the Lord led me into. It says that the effects of this dopamine in the brain put an extreme view on your soulish, sensual parts of your life. Focuses and highlights them and the craving for fulfillment, for importance, for 
position or whatever. And then it says, it creates an over-extreme conviction of self. Its effects literally will motivate a stimulation and an absolute uncontrollable drive and craving for sexual fulfillment because of dissatisfaction, always wanting a better high. It is the literal driving endocrine behind motivation. People who are driven, because it's for recognition or position or whatever, it is the very drug or endocrine that's released into your bloodstream that drives people. So it's the source behind all motivation. It is the source behind all self-gratification. And it literally controls your moods so that people develop habits from them and have no understanding why. And the habits then become things in your life you can't control so that somebody comes to you And the truth of it is, on the negative side, if something has to do with discipline imposed upon me because it's going to limit my self-image, what happens? The dopamine is released and I defend. It said it gets to a stage where the ability of your endorphins and endocrines in your blood system you in the physical can no longer control it. It will control you. And the more you give yourself to it, you will become uncontrollable. There's not a thing you can do about it. Once it's literally converted the actual parts of the brain and the neurons in the brain, there's no reverse. Just think, man, this is unbelievable. Dopamine receptive neurons is what they're called. It's the source that controls your remembrance. Wow, isn't that interesting? You got a high yesterday, so you remember it. You know what we call it in the Bible? Temptation. Because that's what keeps coming back to your brain. I did this yesterday and I got a high from it. I'll do it again. And it develops out of that this drive in your physical body so that then you fulfill a habit. And the habit then controls every action of your life and you can, can no longer control yourself. Dopamine receptive neurons, and they actually increase. It is the source behind your remembering ability from your excitement. It's the thing that literally enthuses and gives enthusiasm. It's the thing that gives encouragement. It's the drive that literally goes after all forms of reward, sexual, whatever, so that then, once you give yourself to it, you don't care how you get it. you just got to get it. Unreal. I had no idea of this. And it's not a new thing. They were talking back there in the early 19th century, in uh, the 1900s when they discovered all of this. I was like, man, how come I didn't know? How come we've never known this? How come nobody's ever told us? It is a driving sensation to always crave to repeat the experience because that pattern and path, that habit, now has to be fulfilled again. So it's the thing that drives temper, mood, hatred, violence, everything. I didn't know that. They said they experimented on all sorts of animals. Here's one, the lack of dopamine when it literally was withheld from rats and they literally shut down those receptors in animals' brains, total despair came. They didn't want to live anymore. They didn't want to eat. The food's in front of them. They didn't want to eat. They just want to die. So that's the reverse because they can't have their cravings fulfilled so they don't want to eat or satisfy themselves anymore. High dopamine individuals are incredible driven achievers. And and remember, this is all not negative. As I said, what I'm talking about is self-control, keeping it in balance. But that's where this, we can only control this when we live by this. You can only control the soul and your emotions when you submit it to the Spirit. And you do what the Spirit says 
not what your emotions tell you. So the lack of dopamine causes despair. Rats would not eat. High dopamine individuals are incredible achievers. They are incredibly competitive. They are very aggressive. They have no sympathy or empathy for anyone. They just want to satisfy themselves. Totally self-motivated and totally self-centered. And when a woman allows that to happen, and it's interesting that now you've got as many women getting on the pornography screens of your computers now as you have as men. Ten years ago it was never like that. Twenty years ago it was unheard of. But now it's equal. And as a result of it, when women get driven by it, literally the aggressive personality comes forward. And it says it stimulates the masculine parts of the female body. She becomes a man. They say pornography is one of the greatest exhibitions of it because you get hooked on it. And you think it's not a drug, there's nothing there. What's going on? Man, how can I? Oh, I won't need to break. Oh, I can stop that, but they can't. It's what they don't understand is what's happening in here. And it's changing your whole personality. I think, man, how, how come I've never seen this? How come I never knew this? I had no idea. It is the driving force behind self, self-image, behind the area of your soul, dissatisfaction, lack of contentment, inability to be satisfied, to settle, to be contented. It drives the human body for total control. I must be king. But man alive, I never knew this. See, we don't think that it has a great deal of significance or importance, but it does. See, what we don't understand is when Jesus said, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. People don't realize he then went on and he said this, I say unto you, enter in at the straight gate. And you say, what does the word straight mean? It means narrow, because he actually goes on and says that. For straight is the gate and narrow is the way. Confined. So he said, enter into the narrow, confined gate. For broad is the way... That leads to destruction. Many that go in there, right? Uh, 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 they're in. Many there are that go there in. So he said, enter in at the straight gate, the narrow one. Do you understand he's talking about the tabernacle of Moses? Let me explain to you. You come into the outer court that is open to natural desire, natural physical satisfaction and craving and all the rest of it, and everybody just wants to feel good. Extremely. Be here for what we can get out of it. I'm not sure I'm talking about here. I'm talking about in the world. But it happens in the churches as well because we have no idea what we're doing. So we're driven by the flesh, the body. So we come in at a broad gate. That gate of the tabernacle had five columns, pillars, and four curtains. It's out of court. Please yourself. All you need to know is just the altar of sacrifice is there. Had your sins forgiven? That's where it is. It's in the outer court. But when you choose to come in to this area, no longer is it five pillars, four curtains. It's four pillars, three curtains. And then when you come through this place here and begin to discipline your life and bring it into the light of the light of the candlestick, thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way by taking, taking heed thereto according to thy word. Father, I pray, John 17, sanctify them by thy truth so that they may be kept from this hour. Then he says thy word is truth. See, so it's submitting to the truth and submitting your soul under the jurisdiction of the truth of God, the Word of God, 
And then you don't stay there. You move in to the narrow gate. Two columns, one curtain. And that's where God said, I'll meet with you at the Ark of the Covenant, where your love is there, not because of the fact that you had to go through all of this and do this, and fulfill all these things. No, no. Your heart, your love, your agape was what motivated you and because you love God and you want to be a lover of God, you'll hear the voice of God speak back to you. Now, I want to end by saying this. If you have children and your children come to you and sit on your knee and say, I want this and I want that and I want the other, because you love them, your love, you say, all right. So you give them something. And they run out. The focus on that type of love is the recipient, not the giver. Jesus said, I say unto you, if you want to be my disciple, take up your cross daily and follow after me. Literally, a daily sacrifice. Then when you come into this place, if you've got children and they come and they just sit on your knee and say, Daddy, Mommy, I love you. Melt your heart. You say, what do you want? Nothing. Tell you you'll give them the thing you gave to them the last time and more because it's not motivated by their selfish love, by their natural cravings to be fulfilled or satisfied. It's literally selfish. And the focus is no longer on the recipient. The focus is on the giver. And I'm telling you, I don't find any places anymore to know anything about this, let alone want to do it. And I'm not trying to be unkind. I'm saying, if we don't get this message and we don't get our act together, I'm telling you, I don't believe any of us have survived are going to survive what's coming. I'm telling you right now. If we will not submit our lives unto the jurisdiction of the Spirit of God and get real with all of this stuff, I'm telling you, you're not going to make it. Because it's not about me. It's not about what I can do or what I can get. That is all self-driven. And the greatest war is in the mind, the soul, the craving to do, to be, to act, to achieve. But the whole focus is self. You ever read these scriptures? To them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. Where's your focus? You're looking for him? What manner of men ought we to be seeing all these things come upon the earth and the Lord shall return again a second time? What manner of men ought we to be in all holiness looking unto and hastening the day of the Lord? Here's the key. Sort our lives out. And I'm telling you, and I'm hearing the story of most of you, and I'm telling you, don't give up. Don't pull back. It says there that if you fall short and pull back, you'll not make it. If you keep pressing forward and the intensity of everything that the enemy is throwing at us is increasing over and over again, I'm telling you, now is not the time to take your hand from the plow. Now is the time to grip it with every commitment and every sense of, an, of unction you have and determination. I am going to follow through and I'm going to be the person God wants me to be. And I'm not going to be led by emotion in this area of my brain and my life. I'm going to literally be led by the Spirit. So the actual emphasis then is upon getting in close to God. I'm telling you, man, with what I saw and what the Lord began to speak to me last night and showed me, and I'm telling you at 2.30, Daphne came in and said, do you realize what the time is? time to get to bed. I said, don't disturb me. If it takes all night, I'll stay here. The Lord had other, other, other ideas. As soon as she turned out and walked out, the whole computer went down, blue screened, crashed. <laughs> so now I've got another major problem. However, that's what it's been like for the last 
period of time since, since December last year. And I'm telling you, I'm pushing through. I'm not pulling back. And that's been real difficult. But I'm saying, this is where we need to link arms. So I'm telling you, not going to survive unless we begin to understand where we're at. As I said, let me end on this note. It is not a thing to fear. We are not to fear. Jesus said, when you see all these things coming upon the earth, men's hearts failing them for fear, do not be afraid. Rather rejoice, for your redemption is drawing near. And I'm saying we are at a phase where I believe there is one more feast to go yet, and it's the Feast of Ingathering. And I, some other time I'll teach you on the Feast of Israel. That one has never been fulfilled in all history, and all the others have. And I'm saying when that hits, there will be an ingathering. And just to drop that, in James 5, 7, it promises it. For the husband, man of the earth, waits with long suffering, with long patience, waiting over the earth till it receives both the former and the latter rain together. He's quoting Joel. And then he said he shall gather in the precious fruit harvest of the earth. And the fruit harvest comes in the seventh month. It's in the day, follows the actual day of atonement. And it's actually just before they would tabernacle and the Lord would come down. And the very last verse in Revelation says, even so come Lord Jesus and he will come down and tabernacle amongst men and they shall be his people, and he shall be their God. See, there's no contradiction in the Scriptures. It's all there, the whole thing. Tabernacle. That's what this is. That's what it's talking about. And if you don't understand it, you'll never see the whole picture. I tell you some of the most beautiful illustrations of Scripture, but we don't hear these things anymore. But it's all there. It's all there. Father, I pray right now, Lord, just the sense of urgency that you put upon my own heart last night. It so challenged me in the middle of all of this, Lord. I don't want to say things that, Lord, I'm not walking myself. So, Lord, I pray that each of us will begin to get before you and not just listen and say this is another message. And that was good but that we will see how this applies to us and then begin to do something about changing our lifestyle, simplifying the things we do, simplifying the things that we're involved in because of what is coming. And Lord, all I can say is I cannot convince anyone. Only your Spirit can do that. So I ask, O Lord, that your Spirit will... Continue to convict our hearts, each one, so that, Lord, we will walk in your light and we will come into that most holy place. And like you said, a servant never knows the will of his master. But I do not call you servants anymore, said Jesus. I call you my friends. For a friend is taken into the confidence of his friend. And the master reveals his heart to his friends, but he doesn't do that to servants. I pray, Lord, that we might learn to live in that most holy place and attune our ear to hear your voice, Lord, and come so that we can sit on the mercy seat and enjoy fellowship with you. I pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. Hallelujah.